from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now I want you to turn with me tonight to the third chapter of John's Gospel. This man, Nicodemus, came to Jesus by night, probably afraid of criticism, or he had a desire for a private conversation, or maybe he wanted to give some more thought before committing himself to Jesus Christ. In any event, he came, and he asked Jesus some questions about spiritual life, and Jesus looked him up and down, and Jesus said, Nicodemus, you need to be born again. In fact, he said, verily, verily, and any time that Jesus uses that expression, that means that what is going to follow is very important. He said, verily, verily, I say unto you, you must, you have to be born again if you're to enter the kingdom of heaven. Two years ago when we were touring Poland, while we were there, we met a priest, a monsignor, who is head of one of the largest theological seminaries in the world. And he said, I want to tell you a story. He said, I got my Ph.D. degree at the University of Chicago. And one day, I was riding in a bus, and sitting behind me was a black woman. And she punched me on the shoulder, and she said, Sir, I beg your pardon, but have you ever been born again? And he said, Well, I suppose I have. He said, I'm a, I'm a priest. She said, That's not the question I ask you, sir. I ask you, had you been born again? And he said, Well, I, 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 uh, she said, have you been born again? And he said he went back to his rooms at the, at the university and got his Bible down and turned to the third chapter of John and reread this passage. And this passage spoke to him, and he said he got on his knees and he had an experience with Christ that he's never been able to get away from. Now, he said, my theology would tell me that I was probably born again at a different period but he said, something happened. You can call it anything you want to, commitment, recommitment, conversion, whatever. Something happened to me. Now, the question I want to ask you tonight is, has that ever happened to you? Give it some other title, some other name, if you want. Call it conversion, call it commitment, call it repentance, call it faith, call it whatever. Has it ever happened to you? Many of you have thought a long time about religion and Christianity. Are you committed? Are you committed to Jesus Christ? Jesus said, you must be born again. Start with your hearts. Be born from above. You can be changed. The world could be changed. The country can be changed. A state can be changed. A family can be changed. A person can be changed. You can be changed. Now, Nicodemus must have been stunned when Jesus said that to him because if Christ had said that to Zacchaeus, who's a tax collector, and they didn't like tax collectors then much more than they do now. But to say it to Nicodemus, one of the great religious leaders of his time, Nicodemus, it says, was a ruler. That meant that he was rich, he was religious, and yet he was searching for reality. How many of you go to church, but you're still searching? There's still an empty place in your heart, and something tells you inside that you're not really right with God. You see, Nicodemus fasted two days a week. Do you know anybody in your church that does that? He spent two hours every day in prayer. How many people do you know that spend two hours every day in prayer? He tithed all his income. Not many people even do that these days. He was a professor at the theological school of theology, and he worked hard at religion. But Jesus said, Nicodemus, that's not enough. You must be born again. Born from above. Now, why did Jesus say that to Nicodemus? Because he could read the heart of Nicodemus. He saw what was in him. He saw that he had covered himself with religion, but he had not yet found the real thing, fellowship with God. What causes all of our troubles in the world? Lying and cheating and hate and prejudice and social inequality and ultimately war? Jesus said, these things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. He said, it's in our heart. He said, our hearts need to be changed. Psychologists and sociologists and psychiatrists all recognize there's something wrong with man. There are many words in Scripture to describe it. There, I'll take only three words. 
One is called a transgression. Sin is a transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4. Sin is a transgression of the law. What law? The law of Moses, the Ten Commandments. Have you ever broken one of those commandments? Then you're guilty of all. It's also the breaking of the law of conscience. Have you ever gone against your conscience at any time? Sure you have. And if you go against your conscience very long, your conscience becomes dull and duller and duller until after a while it's a seared conscience and a dead conscience. And your conscience is no longer a safe guide to go by. It leads you astray because you've gone against it so much. And then there's another one, a commandment, law. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and soul and strength and mind and thy neighbor as thyself. Have you always done that? No. Then you're a sinner in need of forgiveness, in need of being born again. And then another word carries with it the idea of missing the mark or coming short of your duty and a failure to do what you ought to do. The Bible says all unrighteousness is sin. All unrighteousness is sin. And yet before you can get to heaven, you must, you must have righteousness. God says be perfect as I'm perfect, holy as I'm holy. Where are you going to get that perfection? You don't have it now. Where are you going to get that holiness? You don't have it now. But you can't get to heaven if you don't. That's why Christ died on the cross. He died on the cross and shed his blood to provide the righteousness for you so that he provides you with the right kind of clothing to go to heaven. And the clothes that you must have are called the clothes of righteousness. And that was provided for you by Christ. And then there's another word, iniquity, a turning aside from the straight path. Isaiah said, we are like sheep. We've gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. Now, here in Idaho, I know that I think this is a sheep state, maybe the sheep state in the United States. I haven't seen any goats around yet. And maybe you have goats too. In New Zealand, they cross the sheep and the goats and they call them jeeps. That's a fact. And uh, when we were in New Zealand, I couldn't get over the fact of, of what they were doing. I don't know whether that improves them or destroys them. I don't know. But some of you don't know whether you're a sheep or a goat. Now, you see, Jesus said at the judgment, there's going to be the goats on this side and the sheep on this side. And the sheep are going to enter into the kingdom of God. Of course, there he's talking about the judgment of the nations, but it could be applied to individuals. Or it could be that you're a goat and the goats are going to be cast into outer darkness, the Bible says. But one thing, you're not spiritually. You're not a jeep. You can't be both. You have to choose which one. And if you would like to make that choice watching by television, pick up that telephone and call that number that you see on the screen right now and a counselor standing by to talk to you and to help you find Christ as your Lord and Master. Help you with your spiritual problems. They're all over the country. So call right now. And if it's busy, call again. They'll be there all evening. If the lines are tied up, keep calling. Don't give up. The Bible says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. Thus a radical change is needed by every person. We need those sins forgiven. We need to be clothed in the righteousness of God for the purpose of finding fulfillment in this life. Finding something to commit yourself to. What are you committed to? Are you a committed person? Do you really believe in a cause? Do you really believe in a person that symbolizes that cause? Why don't you make your cause Christ and follow him? He'll never let you down. And then not only to find complete fulfillment in this life, but also to be acceptable with God to be acceptable by God. Now, some of you would ask the question, what is the new birth? Nicodemus asked that question. He said, how can a man be born when he's old? You see, Nicodemus, like you and me, he wanted to understand it. He wanted to understand it. Now, I used an illustration years ago 
that I couldn't understand because I was born and reared on a dairy farm. And I still wake up at night with nightmares doing this way. <laughs> because I had to get up every morning during high school at three o'clock and milk 20 cows. And then when I came home from school, I had to milk those same 20 in the afternoon. My father had a small dairy, had about 60 cows that we milked and then we would sell the milk door to door, have a little dairy truck that took the milk early in the morning. And that's all I remember almost as I was a boy because we worked hard on that dairy farm. But how can a black cow eat green grass and produce white milk and yellow butter? I don't understand that. Well, I'll tell you what, because I don't understand it, I'm never gonna drink milk again. I've got to understand that before I can drink milk. I almost quit milk when the cow stepped in the bucket and it just kept on milking. <laughs> I don't understand color television. Do you know that I am so old that I can remember when there was no television? <laughs> now I tell that to one of my grandchildren, they look at me as though I came out of the ark. I can remember when they were, we didn't have any radio. In fact, I remember the first station that came on there was KDKA in Pittsburgh, and my dad had an old crystal set, set, and he said, I think we've got it, and got earphones, and we'd all stand around to try to listen. The only station on there in the United States. That's how old I am. Well, you can't imagine a world without paved highways. You ought to have seen the two ruts in front of our house that went clear to town. They were on the two paved streets in our whole town. Well, suppose I would say, because I don't understand television, how somebody can be in Rome or New York or Jerusalem or someplace like that, and I can see him instantaneously on my set. I don't understand it. I'm not going to watch it. And I push the button to turn it off. I've got to understand it first. Why, well, you'd say you're crazy. Well, of course, I don't understand these computers. I don't understand all these things that they're developing. This whole scientific age has passed me by. We didn't study that in the school I went to. But I accept it by faith. You see, Nicodemus could see only the physical and the materialistic. And Jesus was talking about the spiritual. Jesus said, you must be born again. Now, when he said that, he did not mean that you can inherit it. You cannot inherit it which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Your father and mother can be the greatest born-again Christians in the world, but that doesn't make you a born-again Christian. I can be born in a garage, but that doesn't make me a motor car. <laughs> and there are many people that have the idea that because they are born in a Christian home that they're automatically Christians. Well, you're not. And you cannot work your way alone, not by works of righteousness which we've done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. And then reformation is not enough. You can reform and say, I'm going to turn over a new leaf and I'm going to have new year's resolutions and all the rest of it. Isaiah said, all our righteousness is filthy rags and rags in the sight of God. If you take a pig and take him into your living room and into the bathroom, give him a good bath, wash him down with some Chanel number no. five, put a ribbon around his neck, bring him in the living room. You say, now I've got a new pig. He's, he's turned into a perfect gentleman. Look at him sitting over there. You open the door, let the pig out and see where he goes. His heart hasn't been changed. Only the outside had been changed. And that's the way with some of us. We've been changed some on the outside to conform to certain social standards or certain things that are expected of us in our churches. And yet down inside, we've never been changed. Now that's what Jesus was talking to Nicodemus about. He said, Nicodemus, you need changing inside. And only the Holy Spirit can do that. You must be born from above. That's a supernatural act of God. The Holy Spirit convicts you of your sin, disturbs you about the fact that you've sinned against God. And then secondly, the Holy Spirit regenerates you. That's when you are born again. 
And then the Holy Spirit comes to live in your heart, to help you in your daily life. You don't leave here alone without any help. The Spirit of God goes with you from now on to give you assurance, to give you joy, and to produce fruit in your life, and to teach you the Scriptures. You can't reform. That's not enough. And you can't imitate. You try to imitate Christ. They used to have, a, there was a book Sheldon wrote called In His Steps, and people thought that all you had to do is try to follow Jesus and try to do the things He did, and you'd get to heaven. You can't do it. We can't live up to the Sermon on the Mount. You try living up to the Sermon on the Mount, literally. You can't do it. You don't have that kind of spiritual strength. I told a story that happened many years ago from a couple in Oklahoma. And they had read about this play in New York called My Fair Lady. And they told everybody they were going to New York and they were going to see My Fair Lady. What they didn't know is that it was sold out four or five months in advance. When they got there, they couldn't buy any tickets. So they said, what are we going to do? Our friends all back home will think we saw My Fair Lady. We're going to be embarrassed. So they hit upon a good idea. They went over and they bought one of the books that you could buy for a dollar that told all about the play. And then they saw people, they waited till people started coming out of the theater and they saw some of them throwing their tickets aside that had been cut in half. And so they went over and picked up some tickets. Then they began to hum and sing. I could have danced all night or on the street where she lives or one of those tunes in My Fair Lady. And when they got home, they were humming the tune. They had the book that told about it, and they had the tickets. And everybody thought they'd been to see My Fair Lady. And that's the way you are. You know the religious language. You can sing the songs. You can even pray the prayers. The only thing is you haven't been to the foot of the cross and been born again. That's the message Jesus was trying to get over to this religious leader. Now, to be born again means, in Ezekiel 36, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. In Romans, Paul speaks of it as being alive from the dead. In 2 Corinthians, he calls it being a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. In Peter, Peter says, partakers of a divine nature. John calls it passing from death unto life. The new birth brings about a change in the whole philosophy and manner of living. Now, how is it accomplished? What happens? Well, there's a mystery. Jesus said the wind blows where it listeth, and you cannot tell from whence it cometh or where it goeth. You can see the result. Now, the other day, I did not see, when we had that terrible storm a couple days ago, I did not see the wind, did you? I saw the effects of it. I saw limbs flying by. Parts of a roof torn off flying by. The dust going by. The willow trees bending over. I saw the results of the wind, but I never actually saw the wind. And neither did you. You see, the wind blows where it listeth, Jesus said. There's a mystery to it. And the analogy of natural birth, I think, applies here. You see, Natural birth is the moment of conception. Then there's the nine months of gestation. And then there's actual birth. Now, you may be in one of those stages tonight. This may be the moment of conception for you. It may be another stage of gestation, or it may be actual birth. Only the Holy Spirit could answer that question. That's the mystery of it. There is a mystery that I cannot explain to you. And Jesus did not attempt to explain it to Nicodemus. You see, that's why we're to come by faith to Christ. We can never understand it. Our little finite minds cannot understand the infinite. Our finite minds cannot understand the mighty God. We come by simple childlike faith and put our faith in Jesus Christ. And when you do, you are born again. But it happens this way. First, there has to be the reception of the Word of God. And I believe that is conception. 
1 Peter 1, 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And then in Romans 10, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now tonight you are hearing and you're hearing the word of God and that's the first step. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching or declaration or proclamation to save them that believe. It sounds foolish that men can stand up and use words out of a Bible and that has power to penetrate your heart and change your life. But it does because it's God's holy word. This is not an ordinary book. This is a living book, a living word. And then there's the work of the Holy Spirit, as I've already explained. He convicts. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. And then he indwells. He changes us. He changes our wills, our affections, our objectives for living, our disposition. He gives us a new purpose and new goals. Old things pass away and everything becomes new. And then he indwells. Know you not that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Does God, the Holy Spirit, live in you? If there's a doubt about it, pick up that telephone if you're watching by television and call that number. And a counselor will be there to help you to make sure that you have been born again. You remember the story in the Bible of Naaman? Naaman was the general commander in chief of all the armies of Syria, and Syria is much in the news these days. He was commander in chief. He had everything. The king had honored him. But he was a leper, and he knew that in a short time he was going to be thrown out of the military, and he was going to be just a, a person going around with a little bell saying, keep away, keep away, keep away. I'm a leper, I'm a leper, I'm a leper. And he heard a little slave girl from Israel tell about a wonderful man that could heal him over in Israel. And he went to his king, and the king said, if anybody in Israel can heal you, please go. And he went. And when he finally came to this man after a number of experiences, the prophet said, go to the Jordan and dip seven times and on the seventh time you will be healed. Told the servant to tell him that, in fact, the prophet didn't even come out to see the general. The general was there in all of his uniform and all of his men, and the prophet just stayed back in the kitchen somewhere, didn't even come out and greet him, just sent word to him. And the general turned away in disgust. But one of his captains said to him, or one of his aides said, Sir, if he had told you a hard thing, you would have done it. He said, Go to the Jordan. He said, yeah, but the Jordan River is muddy and our rivers are clear. That Jordan River can't do anything. He said, but why don't you try, sir? You're a leper. You've got to do something. So the general went to the Jordan River and he dipped himself four or five times and he said, see, the leprosy is still there. It doesn't do any good. But sir, he said seven times. So Naaman went down for the seventh time and when he came up, his skin was clean and whole. The thing that had saved him was the fact that he did what the prophet had told him. The greatest prophet of them all is Jesus Christ. And he says, you must be born again. How do you become born again? Repenting of sin, that means you're willing to change your way of living and you'll say to God, I'm a sinner and I'm sorry. Simple, childlike. And then by faith receive him as your Lord and Master and Savior. And then be willing to follow him in a new life of obedience in which the Holy Spirit helps you as you read the Bible and pray and witness. If there's a doubt in your mind that you have been born again, I hope you'll settle it before you leave here tonight because the Bible says now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. The Bible says, He that hardeneth his heart, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off, and that without remedy. You just can't come to God any time you want to. You can only come when the Holy Spirit is drawing and He's speaking to you tonight in answer to the prayers of thousands of people in Idaho and throughout the country. Come to Christ tonight. Why do I ask people to come publicly? We've seen several thousand people do what I'm going to ask you to do. I ask you to come publicly because Jesus said, if you don't acknowledge me before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father which is in heaven. 
He hung publicly for you on the cross. Certainly you can come in front of this audience in this beautiful stadium and receive him into your heart. I'm going to ask you to do that right now. If you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait on you, but I'm going to ask you to come and stand here in front of the platform. And this is a symbolic act of an inward decision that you're making. And after you've all come, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you and give you some literature, then you can go back and join your friends. God bless you. It's wonderful to know that tonight can be a night of new beginning for you. You say, well, how? Take a moment to call that number on your screen or to write to Billy Graham tonight or this week and let him know about your desire and we'll send you some help through the mails that will encourage you and help you make your decision for Jesus Christ. If you just prayed that prayer with my father or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. Toward the battle into the darkness. Anytime, anywhere. This is our mission. Sharing hope. Jesus. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Tonight, I want to turn you to turn with me to a very familiar passage of Scripture to all of you. And uh, that is uh, found in Romans, the first chapter, and the 17th verse. And then I want us to turn over to Galatians, the sixth chapter, where in the book of Galatians, the apostle Paul is explaining what he meant in the 17th verse of the first chapter. And this was the verse that shook all of Europe a little over 500 years ago when it was discovered and it was revealed to him in a powerful way to Martin Luther. First chapter of Romans, the 17th verse. And therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. Not by our own goodness, not by our own works, but by faith. By grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God not of works, lest any man should boast. Then we turn over to Galatians, the sixth chapter. What a marvelous chapter this fifth chapter is, and the sixth chapter. And the sixth chapter has something I want to speak on, and I've never before preached a sermon on this text. Be beginning with verse 7, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh, shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. I want to speak tonight on sowing and reaping. I noticed as we came in the lush farmland that's here in this Red River Valley. I guess there's nothing quite like it in the United States. I used to come to Fargo quite often, stop here at Fargo, Moorhead, you couldn't get to Winnipeg without stopping on Northwest Airlines here on a DC-3. Back in the 40s, we used to go back and forth to Winnipeg a lot, and we stopped here a lot. And I would see this country and often marvel at its lushness and congratulate you and your grandparents and parents that came here and settled here because this has become one of the great areas of the entire United States. I was born and reared on a farm 
And I've read about families that have been losing their family farms. And I was reared on a family farm. And I remember the days back in the 20s and the 30s, back during the Depression when my father would look for rain and we would pray for rain and we raised wheat and barley and grain. We didn't have sugar beets, but we did raise other things that would be familiar to you. Then my father had a, what he called a truck farm where he raised vegetables. And then we had dairy cattle and we milked. And every morning from the time I was about seven or eight, I had to get up at three o'clock and go milk cows. And when I was in high school, I milked 20 cows every morning before I went to school and milked those same 20 when I came home from school. And so I knew a little bit about farm work. Now, I believe that they're in the Bible. There are five laws in sowing and reaping. First, you must sow to reap. In China, 2,000 years old seed were taken from an ancient tomb and they're sprouting today and growing tomatoes, even though they were sown 2,000 years ago. But it wasn't until they were sown that they could produce a crop for reaping. We have to sow to reap. Now in Hosea, it says, sow to yourselves in righteousness. Think of it, sow in goodness, sow in righteousness, reap in mercy. If you sow in righteousness, living a good life, putting your faith and your confidence in Christ, you are going to reap the mercy of God and the grace of God and salvation. For it is time, the scripture says, to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Has righteousness rained upon you? Because unless you are clothed in the cloth of the righteousness of God, you'll never enter heaven. And that suit of clothes or that dress of righteousness was provided by the Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross for you. We have a cross on our, all of our churches, whatever our denomination may be. We agree on one thing, that the cross is the central fact of Christianity. And it's on the cross that Christ hung for our sins and died for us and provided for us a righteousness that you cannot provide for yourself. In Psalm 126, 5, it says, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Our Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross in tears, as it were, so that we might have the joy of salvation. Now, if you want to become a lawyer or a doctor or a scientist or a professor, you have to spend years of study. You, sto you sow study and you reap professionally. There was a hillbilly from the south who felt lost at Times Square, New York. So he asked a young fellow with a long beard, how, is the, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? And snapping his fingers, the bearded man replied, practice man, practice. <laughs> and to be a great musician like Pavarotti, you have to practice passionately and perpetually. You reap excellence if you sow effort, but you have to sow in order to reap. Have you been sowing in good deeds? Have you been sowing in repentance? Have you been sowing in faith? Have you been sowing in Bible reading and prayer and church going faithfully? Have you been sowing so you can reap the grace and the mercy of God? Or have you been sowing the wild oats that so many people sow? Or been sowing things for your own lust and your own pleasures? And you're going to reap someday that which you have sowed. And then the second thing, if you sow, you will reap. Every person is a sower and a reaper. Now the Bible teaches that Satan is a deceiver. And in Galatians 6 it says, be not deceived. Many of you are already deceived. He that soweth to his flesh, that is lust, drugs, wrong kinds of sex, too much drink, shall of the flesh reap corruption. In Proverbs 6, it says, A wicked man soweth discord, therefore shall his calamity come suddenly. Suddenly shall he be broken without remedy. The Bible warns that if we continue that kind of life, we will be broken. We'll, we're going to reap what we sow. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow in his The Reaper and the Flowers says, 
Though the mills of God grind slowly, yet they grind exceedingly small. You remember Cain became jealous of his brother Abel, and he killed his brother in a fit of jealousy and rage and became the first murderer, and that was the first war, and that took place in paradise. Many people say, oh, if we only change society, if we make the world better, if we spend more money, if everybody had everything they wanted, it would, they would, we would produce a new man. This is what uh, Marx taught. This is what Lenin strongly believed. He had great ideals. He believed that they would ultimately produce a new man, but we've lived long enough now to know that it has not produced a new man. The only person that can produce a new man is the one that said, you must be born again. It doesn't mean really born again. It means born from above, born by the Spirit of God. Just as you were born into the physical world and from your mother's womb, you must be born into the spiritual world. And so in one sense, it's being born the second time. The third thing is you will reap what you sow. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. In Numbers 32, it says, be sure your sin will find you out. Be sure your sin, and we're all sinners. I'm a sinner, you're a sinner. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And sin means the breaking of God's law, the breaking of the Ten Commandments. And the Bible says if you break those commandments in one place, you're guilty of all. And we're all sinners and we've broken all the commandments. We all need the mercy and the grace and the love of God. Be sure your sin will find you out. Every sin that has ever been committed is going to be found out either in this life or at the judgment. Somewhere, sometime, every little sin that you've committed and every big sin will find you out. Because you remember the tapes back in Watergate days and what they did to a president? God has tapes far more sophisticated. Not only does he record all of our actions, but all of our thoughts, all of our words, all of our intents are recorded. And you may deny it at the judgment and say, God, it just didn't happen that way. He's got it all there. He has every moral choice you faced and he has the road that you took. You'll reap what you sow. In Job 4, it says, they that plow iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same. You're going to reap. Everything that you sow, you'll reap. I read in Time Magazine review of a book entitled Wild Oats, and some people live by the philosophy that you sow your wild oats all week, then go to church on Sunday morning and pray for a crop failure. It's not going to be that way. The crop is going to come in. And how many of us go to church and we really don't know Christ? I did. I was really a Presbyterian. And I was baptized. I was confirmed in the church. And I thought everything was all right. I thought the minister was a little bit boring. I didn't particularly like going to church, but I went because my parents told me to go. And if you knew my father, you know you'd go if he told you. But I really didn't have Christ in my heart. I didn't have assurance. I didn't know that if I died, I'd go to heaven. I wasn't sure of that. I wasn't certain that my sins had been forgiven. So one day when they had an evangelistic meeting, I went forward and received Christ into my heart and recommitted my life to Christ. And I remember the things that I promised those elders when I met with them at the time of confirmation. And I said, Lord, I'm going to recommit my life to you. I'm going to surrender to you. I'm not sure where I stand, but I want to be sure. And that simple decision changed my entire life. But life doesn't always work that way. In Proverbs 28, it says, He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whosoever confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. God is willing to have mercy upon you. He's willing to bestow his grace upon you. He's willing to forgive you if you willing to repent of your sin and receive him. You see, the Bible says that sin is no respect of persons. In James 1, it says, Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. 
Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. And that death is not only natural death when your body dies, but you can be dead right now where you're sitting. Spiritually dead. You're dead toward God. That's the reason people can't find peace and joy and happiness today. They search for it. They want it. But they can't find it. You can't find it in drugs. You can't find it in an extramarital affair. You can't find it any other place. Oh, you can have a temporary time. You can get drunk and go out with some girl and have a good time for a while. But it soon wears off. It's gone. I had a bishop. We've had a number of bishops, but one bishop in particular who came forward in our meeting. An Anglican bishop in England. And later, I saw him privately. And I said, Bishop, why did you have to come forward? He said, you know, I've been to the university, I've gotten my degrees, and I've been to the theological school and all the rest. And he said, I'm, I'm now in my 50s and I'm a bishop. But he said, I am not sure where I stand before God. And I just wanted to make sure. Do you feel that way? You can make sure tonight before you leave here. And then the fourth thing, the ignorance of what you are sowing won't keep you from reaping. Leviticus 19, 19 says, Thou shalt not sow thy field with mingled seed. The Bible teaches that when the good seed of the Word of God is sown, the devil comes along and sows tares. Jesus said you can sow or allow to be sowed in your life to the devil and you'll reap hell. The devil for thousands of years has been issuing an invitation to hell to all of those who sow to the sins of the flesh, to those who permit Satan to sow tares in their lives. Come to Christ now. Give him your life. On the cross, Jesus Christ conquered Satan and hell and sin. And in 1 John 3, 8, it says, He that committeth sin is of the devil. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil so that we might live the life after Christ. 1 John 4, 4 says, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Christ comes to live within you and gives you a new power to live a life that you never dreamed you could live. And he produces within you love and joy and peace and satisfaction and fulfillment that you never knew before. And he puts you on the right road because Jesus said there are two roads of life, the broad road that leads to destruction and the narrow road that leads to life everlasting. And then fifthly and lastly, you will reap more than you sow. Hosea 8, 7 says, They have sown the wind and they shall reap the whirlwind. John 4, 36 says, He receiveth wages that reaps. Charles Reed wrote a century ago, Sow an act and you reap a habit. Sow a habit and you reap a character. Sow a character and you reap a destiny. Lord Macaulay, the great historian, once wrote, Old men reap. Someone was showing a clergyman through one of the prisons the other day in the east. And they saw an old man sitting there weeping. And they asked the warden, what is he doing? And the warden replied, he's reaping. And that's where many of us are going. We're going to a place where we're going to reap. We've been sowing all these weeks and months and years, and we think we're getting by with it. Our conscience no longer bothers us. Why? Because the Bible teaches that you can harden your conscience. You can cause it to become dead. It no longer speaks. It's no longer an accurate guide for you. Come to Christ and he'll resensitize your conscience. A hundred million people die every year. 270 million die every day. 10,000 people die every hour. 180 die every minute. Three die every second. And you will be one of those statistics one of these days. Are you ready to meet God? The Bible says prepare to meet God. Jesus said, the dead shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Two crowds. You say, well, Billy, what do I have to do to make sure, to make certain? Many people want to be sure, but they don't know what to do. First, you must repent of sin. The word repent means to turn, to change 
to change the direction of your life, to change your mind. You change your mind about God, you change your mind about yourself and your need of God. And you go home ready to change the way you treat your wife or your husband or your parents or your children or your neighbors or the people you work with. You're ready for a change. Second, you put your total confidence and your total faith in Christ alone. You're not depending on anything else for your future salvation except the cross and the resurrection of Christ. For by the grace of God are you saved. The word grace means unmerited favor, something I don't deserve. Billy Graham doesn't deserve to go to heaven. I deserve to go to the judgment. I deserve hell. But I'm going to heaven by the grace of God by Christ who died on the cross and said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And in that terrible moment, something happened that none of us really understands. God laid on him the sins of us all. Jesus became the great sin bearer. He died for us. Then he comes into our hearts and he gives us a power to do good works. And we go out with a burden for our neighbors, a burden for peace in the world, for a burden to help the hungry, to feed the poor, to help the poor. That's our responsibility as believers. But we don't have the power to do the things we ought to do or to live the life we ought to do. But Jesus Christ gives it to you. He rose again. And we reap eternal life, forgiveness, peace, joy, love, the power of the Holy Spirit comes within eternity in heaven. We sang the song a moment ago, Amazing Grace. Do you know the story of that song? It was written by a slaver, a man by the name of John Newton. And John Newton became the slave of a slave in West Africa. And one day when he was coming back to England on the slave ship and treating the slaves miserable and terrible, it had a thunderstorm and he fell on his face and he remembered some scriptures that his mother had taught him when he was a boy and he received Christ into his heart and it changed his life and he went back to England and became a great friend of those who were to someday lead the fight against slavery in Parliament and did more to help probably than any other person motivate the British people toward outlawing slavery. He himself became the minister of an Anglican church. He himself wrote many hymns. And that was one of the hymns he wrote, Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound. I don't deserve it. John Newton said, I don't deserve it. And when he was an old man and he could barely get up into the pulpit and he was in his middle 80s, he held on to the pulpit and he said, I don't know much. But he said, I do know this, that I'm a great sinner and I have a great Savior. And John Newton left his mark for God after being a terrible sinner. You can be forgiven of any sin, any failure. It may be hypocrisy, whatever it is, but tonight you'd like to make sure. I'm going to ask you to do something that I've asked Africans for the thousands to do, Asians for the thousands, Europeans for the thousands, Americans for the thousands, and I've seen them do it for the thousands. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat where you're sitting right now and come and stand in front on this beautiful turf and stand there for a moment or two quietly and say, you know, I want to be sure about this. I want to be sure my sins are forgiven. I want to know I'm going to heaven. I want this supernatural peace and joy and fulfillment that Christ can give me. And I want to settle it. I would like to rededicate myself to my confirmation vows or to my what my baptism meant. Whatever the reason, whatever your need, I'm going to ask you to get up and come and stand. And after you've all come and stood there, I'm going to have a prayer with you and give you some literature to help you in your Christian life. If you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait. Or you may be the only one from your area to come, but get up and come. I'm going to ask that no one leave the stadium now at this holy moment. And everyone in an attitude of prayer, you get up and come. You may be a member of the church. You may not be a member of any church. I don't know who you are, but you need Christ. 
you come right now. We're going to wait on you. Just come and stand here quietly, young and old, whatever, whoever you are. We're going to wait, Catholic or Protestant, Jewish, whatever. You come and stand here and say yes and make sure of your relationship to Christ. And you may be in the choir or you may just be somebody that wandered in, but God is speaking to you. You come. Just stand here in front behind those cameras that are around here or right in here. We're going to wait on you quickly. Bring somebody with you. And as these many hundreds make their personal decision for Christ here in Fargo, North Dakota, you too, wherever you are, can make that decision. Call the number on your television screen right now. If the line is busy, wait a few moments and call again. I want to say a word to you that have been watching on television. You've been watching from other parts of the country and other parts of other countries. And you see people coming here in Fargo, Moorhead City, Fargo, North Dakota, Moorhead City, Minnesota, and other parts of this great Midwestern area, or Northern Plains area, whatever area we want to call it. And you see them coming to make their commitment. You can make your commitment where you are, in your hotel room, or in your bedroom, or in your living room, or with your family. Make your surrender to Christ now and say, Lord, I need you. Come into my heart. Forgive my sin. Give me assurance of my own faith. I'm going to pray that you'll make that commitment now. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers.